Shalom guys, welcome back to another episode here at Yashavia Ministries with Casa de Israel Yael, like I would say. Thank you for being here. If you like the content that we have on our channel, like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, put them in the comment section down below. Now this week's Torah portion is uh, short, um, but we're going to keep it short as well. We're going to talk about a little bit about, about the beginning of the Torah portion and the middle. And we're going to focus on Sarah and Abraham's request for his son Isaac and what it entails and what is his message what is he trying to portray morally we have been following a trend in the last couple of Torah portions understanding the concept and the mindset of the people and the civilization where Abraham comes from and where Abraham lives and how Abraham is trying to be distinct based on how Elohim wants him to carry himself and how he's going to perpetuate through the next generations, this that Elohim has given him. And so we're going to focus on that, but before we do that, let's do a Torah blessing. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Bless Adonai who is blessed now and forever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen us from among the peoples, has given us the Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives the Torah. Amen. So, this week's Torah portion is Shaye Sarah. So, let's get started. So, this week's Torah portion starts in Genesis 23. We're going to jump right to it, and we're going to see how it opens. We're going to continue that, and then we'll jump into Abraham and his seeking for his son's uh, future wife. Okay, let's get reading. So it says, "Vayichu hayei sara ma'a shana va'ae shirim shana va'sheva shanim shene hayei sara." And in English, it says the following: Now Sarah lived one hundred and twenty-seven years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kirya Arba, that is in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose before his dead, spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger, a soldier among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The sons of Heth as Abraham, saying to him, Here is my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choice of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. Now, this is where negotiations start. Because Abraham is mourning his wife, he stands up, and the moment for him mourning the dead has finished. Now he, ha he wants to lay his wife to rest so that he can move on. In his walk and so he is trying to find a place in the land but Abraham wants to buy a specific spot and is going to be a marker is going to be the beginning of the family of Abraham buying the land and inheriting the land and establishing inheritances in that land okay and so the sons of Het the Hittites the Hatti people, uh, which they come from the Hittite land or the Hatti, and they're known for destroying or uh, uh, overpowering the Babylonian Empire. And so they have a, a spot or they have a dominion in the land of Canaan as of this moment. And so Abraham is negotiating with these sons uh, a space for his wife. And it's interesting because they call him a prince, so it lets you know how Abraham morally was carrying himself to an extent that even these pagan uh, uh, nations that worship many gods and that had different uh, structures of society had a certain perspective on Abraham, and Abraham was living according to what Elohim was guiding him. So it gives you an, an understanding of how Abraham carried himself in the world in his time. So let's keep reading. So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and approach 
the front the sun was so hard for me that he may give me a cave in Machpelah which he owns which is at the end of the field for the full print price let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site now Ephraim was sitting among the sons of Heth Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth even of all who went in the gate of the city saying no my lord hear me i'll give you the field and i'll give you the cave that is in it in the presence of the sons of my people and i give it to you bury your dead now here is getting interesting because now the hittite representative in this case is trying to say no 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 uh in front of these people in the entrance of the city said and it's understood that in the entrance of the city gate where where the judges were where the judicial systems will enact and establish uh, their judgments and, and how they would go about uh, their judicial proceedings. And so he is in the entrance of the city in front of his people. And he's saying in front of all these people, I'll give you my land and I'll give you that spot and I'll give you the opportunity to bury your wife there. But Abraham understands that culturally, if he does that, they have in the Hittite law code, a, a specification and a rule that the owner of that land was subjected to the king and to that, that king's uh, gods and to that king's ruling. And so if Abraham would have taken this land without payment, he would have basically became a, uh, in the vassal as a Syrian treaty, Abraham would have became a, a vassal to this Hittite representative. And so Abraham would have had to be under his service and would have had to go be under his king and under his God. And so Abraham was trying to separate himself from that and at the same time be able to bury his wife. And so he's negotiating. He wants to buy it. And eventually he does, right? He, they negotiate. He says, no, 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 I'll, I'll give it to you. Abraham says, no, please, I'll buy it. Tell me the price. And then he gives him a price. And so... We're going to continue with the PowerPoint and uh, establish uh, what the Torah portion basically is about. So Genesis chapter 23, verse 1 to chapter 25, eight, uh, verse 18. The prophet portion is 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 31. And the New Testament portion of Brit Halasha, which is chapter uh, 4, verse 3 to 14 of the book of John. So part one of this Torah portion is Shayei Sarah, the life of Sarah, begins with the account of her death, which was 127 years of age, and tells how the first great uh, matriarch of the Jewish people was buried in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron, a burial site which Abraham had purchased from Ephron the Hittite for a hundred shekels of silver. Since the account of Sarah's death is given just uh, after the account of the near sacrifice of Isaac, it is very interesting. Some of the sages link the events together, suggesting that the shock of the loss of her beloved son at the hand of her husband was just too much to bear. Now, again, this is their, what they think, what they believe. But interestingly enough, when Abraham bought the land, he bought it with the trees and he bought the cave with the tree with the land. And so that basically became a marker and the, the trees became representations of like a fence when you put a fence in your house. And it was dividing the land and it let you know how much land was yours, okay? And this is basically how the patriarch started to uh, accumulate land legally uh, by the laws of men in a way, okay? Part two of this uh, Torah portion is Abraham warning Eliezer to seek a bride for Isaac. Abraham knew that the Canaanites were destined to be ejected from the land and erased from history. He did not think it prudent that his seed, to whom God had promised the land, should intermarry with a race from whom the land was to be taken. Now, this happens in chapter 24, so we're going to read a little bit about it, the introduction, so we can get an idea of what's going on here, okay? Because remember, Abraham is making distinctions now, understanding what we talked about last week and how the world saw and how the system of the world was in Mesopotamia, Cain and Canaanites, because understanding that they had a polytheistic mindset, many gods, these gods, you know, served them by their function, whether it be water, sun, rain, 
seas, earth, crops, all of these gods served them and gave them what they needed. And, and, and whenever the gods were fighting, then they were punished. So they had this cosmology and cosmogony and all of these things in their mind while Abraham was over here believing in one God and following instructions. Okay. Establishing a generation of men of God. Okay. So let's read chapter 24. Now Abraham was old in an advancing age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charged all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, Adonai of heaven, and the uh, God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaan, among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife from my son Isaac. Then the servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Shall I take your son back to the land from where you came? Abraham said to him, Be aware that you do take my son back there. And the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, For your descendants... I will give this land, and he will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. And the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of goods, and his masters in his hand, and he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor, Isaac, and Rebekah. It's interesting that it says, put your hands under my thigh. It's possible that the oath is sworn on the jewel. This word right here was straight from Rico Cortez. Uh, and the jewel. Yes, it is it is weird, guys. But understand that is is a cultural thing that was happening in the time. And and the reason why it was done this way, you can understand or interpret that is based on what was most valuable. And what I mean valuable is that the descendancy was uh was there. And so it came from there in a way, the seeds of Abraham. And so he made and swore on his descendancy. Okay? Remember, it's just a custom. It, you know, we don't do that no more. Just want to clarify. Continue. So, the oath was sworn to the jewels of Abraham, which would then be understood to be binding even if Abraham should die. None of these can be confirmed, however, because the text offers no explanation and no parallels and have been found in ancient Near East. Okay? Now, it says, go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. In the ancient world, it was common to restrict or at least prefer marriage within the social group, a practice called endogamy or endogamy. It's particularly significant in social contexts that emphasizes inheritance in this way. The lineage is isolated for uh, purposes of social status and property ownership. Okay. Now. In Israel, the concerns are ethnic because the land was promised to Abraham and his family, and he is avoiding assimilation with the people in the land. At this point in history, no one else shares Abraham's beliefs or worships the God of Abraham. So remember, Abraham's perspective is based on what he was surrounded and how the world worked in that time. And so Abraham was thinking about the future of his descendancy and his sons in the future generations. And he believed and understood what culturally was going around him and the influences. And so that's why he wanted to make sure that his son had an opportunity with somebody that will obey his father and obey his, his God. Okay. Now it is weird because you might say, well, he's sending him to get a, a wife from his family, his own family. Yes, but understand this is a cultural thing, right? Eventually, this has become to not be the case anymore. But in that time, it was, okay? Now, in today's world, there are no Canaanites. The Canaanites ceased to be an, an identifiable people group long ago. 
Nevertheless, the warning still has relevance for our outreach efforts today. The Canaanite religion became a toxic poison for the children of Israel, seducing them into idolatry and syncretism. Likewise, we must not bring the religion of Canaan into the house of Abraham. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light and with darkness? What has a believer in common with the unbeliever, or what agreements has a temple of God with the idols? For we are the temple of the living God. 2 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 through 16. Now, pointing out that the problem here is not the person, okay? Like, you pushing away the person itself is not the problem. You, what you're doing right now, and what Abraham is doing, and what Abraham is trying to establish is that this is not a religion or re religious thing. This is a, a generational thing, right? You're trying to instill values that will be perpetuated through time just like we understood that it was common in the time that they didn't want to be spread or that they didn't want their name to be forgotten and so abraham was gonna do something different obviously elohim was gonna do it through abraham and it was that elohim was gonna spread abraham all around the world but what he was gonna spread was the function and the and the and the ability of people to do God's will and that's where we come in right because through Abraham right the promise that was given through Abraham which comes in fulfillment through Yeshua we have access to the kingdom and the Elohim tells us and Abraham tells us that assimilation is not so much about the people or the person itself assimilation comes when you adopt the system that we talked about it last week where there was a God and then there was many gods, but in the middle of the God and the many gods, there is a king and priest. And whatever these gods say is interpreted by these men. Okay. Elohim was speaking directly to his men, each of them. And he was trying to speak directly to the people, right? Every time that the people lost the ability to have direct contact with Elohim because they chose to. Mount Sinai was an example of that. They heard the voice of Elohim, but it was too powerful. They got afraid. There was Israel was supposed to have a priest each tribe, and they did the sin of the golden calf. And the only ones that repented was the Levitical priesthood. So they were chosen. They were chosen to be near. Every prophet, every messenger, every person that has represented Elohim is because they chose to draw near him, and they chose not only to draw near but to go out and bring people near. The point is based on the quality that you're trying to bring in and the quality that you're willing to give out. And it's interesting because when Eleazar here goes to see for his wife, he's afraid. He's like, you know, what if I don't see the right woman for, for the son of my master? And he prays for a specific woman that will give him the response that he's looking for, that will remind him of what his uh, master's house is. And Rebecca gives him that. And we're going to see it real quick, okay? He says, Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me a success today and show love and kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring and the daughter of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please lay down your jar so that I may drink and who answers drink, I will water your camels. Also, may she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown love and kindness to my master and before he had finished speaking behold rebecca who was born of, to bethuel son of milcha the wife of abraham's brother nahor came out with his her jar on her shoulder the girl was very beautiful a virgin and no man had had relations with her and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up then the servant ran to meet her and said please let me drink a little water from your jar she said, drink, my lord, and she quickly lowered her jar to her head and gave him a drink. Now, when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into a throw and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know 
whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, weighing it half a shekel and two braces for her wrist, weighing ten shekels in gold. And he said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Betuel, the son of Melcha, whom she bore to Nahor. And again, she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed and a room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brother. It's interesting how what triggered this servant was the manifestation of justice and righteousness of this woman. And he was in expectation of this. And many people are in expectation of us coming believers and representing God. And sometimes we misrepresent him because we're focusing on us. And something that Abraham is teaching us and that Rebecca taught us is that serving and doing God's will is what's going to make us stand out. And after understanding this line of thoughts that we've been following the last couple of Torah portions, understanding the systems of the world and how the world works, the world works in a I, idol worship, whether it be singers, actors, athletes, whether it be your own self, you fall into the trap of worshiping yourself or worshiping your ideas and worshiping what you think. And sometimes the world is looking for people that will just represent God and do good things, do simple things, honorable things. That's why I always tell the youth, establish moral values and hold on to them because the world is giving them away and throwing them in the trash. So what we can learn from this and from what's going to start becoming the conclusion of the part that Abraham brings us is that Abraham taught us that morally we have to be willing to do anything and everything for Elohim and we're willing, we have to be willing to walk we have to be willing to walk to walk and talk to talk doing justice and righteousness and we have to be willing to search and establish a perpetuity of God's kingdom in our generations and our descendancies and it all starts with our example so live what you say you believe believe what you say you live I think I said that right and honor God in everything that you do so hope you guys have a great week Shabbat Shalom thank you yeah.